Welcome to The Strategic Investor. Join us as we interview some of the world's most productive asset managers and uncover sophisticated and unique investment strategies in the markets. Here is your host, Charlie Wright. Hello and welcome to Strategic Investor Radio on OC Talk Radio, where we bring you investment strategies you are not hearing elsewhere. I'm Charlie Wright. We thank you for joining us today. This is going to be most interesting. We have the opportunity to speak with Roger Lowenstein, author and former journalist and columnist for the Wall Street Journal. Roger, welcome to Strategic Investor Radio. Charlie, it's great to be on the show. So, Roger, uh, you wrote the column Heard on the Street for years at the Wall Street Journal. You have written books, which include When Genius Failed, about the long-term capital management 1998 fiasco that we all got to pay for. Uh, You've written Buffett, The Making of an American Capitalist. You've written The End of Wall Street, following the 2008 credit crisis. And most recently, a couple of years ago, you published America's Bank, The Epic Struggle to Create the Federal Reserve. So, Roger, give us your background in history here, will you? Well, I won't go back to, uh, you know, Adam and Eve, uh, but the, I think the relevant uh, part of, of uh, my history, Charlie, is uh, when I was at the Wall Street Journal, as you mentioned, riding the Herd in the Street column. And um, I didn't have, uh, prior to then, actually a financial background or even a financial bent that covered uh, uh, covered Latin America for the journal, uh, covered various things for them, the oil markets and so on. And, and uh, Norm Perlstein, terrific uh, managing editor at the journal then, uh, put me on the herd column. And we would, um, you know, so there were a few of us uh, on the beat, and we'd get a stock and that looked interesting and write it up uh, as either a buy or sell for, for, uh, for readers, you know, thinking that the, the price was either under or overvalued. And one thing that struck me was, you know, a lot of these ideas were... Um, suggested to us, I use the term delicately, or foisted at us, or peddled to us by people who, you know, with an agenda, people who owned the stock or were short the stock. And uh, I began to be amazed by uh, how adamant they were. They were, uh, you know, earnestly pushing it. You've got to write this thing. You've got you know, you to knock it down. You've got you to let people know what a great buy it is, whatever. And, of course, we were never allowed to tell them which way we were going to write it because the, the journal had had that one... Um, Terrible incident with Foster Winans, who would leaked his uh, who'd leaked his uh, columns, but nonetheless, uh, I could feel uh, what tremendous stake these people put in what the journal would do was going to say, you know, on, on the day after tomorrow, or the day after that, which meant these weren't really investors; these were people uh, with a myopic, uh, incredibly short-term outlook. All, all they were in it for was what was the Wall Street Journal going to say on Thursday, because. You know, and, and from the long-term point of view, what did it really matter? If they were so right, it was going to, it was going to come out, uh, you know, sooner or later anyway. But they really wanted that um, short-term uh, hit. At the same time, uh, and, and thanks to uh, my father, uh, who was a corporate lawyer and had a, uh, I guess, a, a passing association with Warren Buffett, uh, we had uh, in, in the family we owned some Berkshire stock, so I was already in the habit of reading. Uh, Buffett's uh, annual reports every year, and obviously paying attention to the stock as it was going up. And I realized that the analysts I was talking to, column in, column out, about what the stock was going to do or what that stock was going to do, uh, weren't half as smart in terms of how markets worked and what was a sensible approach to uh, investing as Buffett was. Uh, so, you know, I walked in one day and said, um, uh, and said to my editor, I'm, I'm going to take a leave. I'm going to go write a biography on this guy, uh, Warren Buffett. Uh, they thought I was kind of crazy. There wouldn't be any interest in him. That, that's hard to believe at this point <laughs> that there wouldn't be interest in Warren Buffett. So uh, was that a good experience? Did you appreciate that and enjoy it? And did uh, obviously you learned? Yeah, you know, I I, um, I wrote a proposal and uh, sent this uh, into a into a, an agent and then a, a publishing house and. Uh, they liked the idea. Buffett was not very well known then. Uh, uh, stock, I'm trying to remember exactly. Stock was about three thousand dollars or something a share. Then it was already, wow. you know, sort of a phenomenon. But you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, you could put a, uh, you know, uh, hundred hundred fold on that today. Yeah. Um, and uh, I remember that after I got the contract to write the book, 
then I I wrote Buffett and said, uh, yeah, I'm going to be your biographer. Uh, look, looking forward to working with you, and uh, you know, I'm going to want to interview you in your office, see you in your home, go on the road with you, see you with uh, negotiate when you're doing a deal or whatever. And he just wrote me back a very polite but uh, terse note that said, uh, no thanks. <laughs> really? Uh, you're on your own. <laughs> uh, and that was, um, but he said something interesting that was, he said it'll be better for me this way. You know, he didn't want the interruption in, in his uh, in his life and schedule. I, I think also he didn't want the responsibility uh, for the book that comes with being, uh, uh, you know, in some sense, a, a cooperating source. Co- cooperating, yeah. Yeah. He also said it'll be better for you, for for you, Roger. And, um, you know, I I sort of thought it in the beginning that he was um, just trying to make it sound palatable. But by the end, I realized um, that he was right, because um, I think if I'd had, you know, Buffett giving me his take uh, day in, day out, story in, story out, uh, it might have been a, a very interesting book, uh, but it would have been more his book. And this um, freed me to to write it in my own voice and with my own take on it, and you know, to write my book. And, and I think it's helped me in the books that I've written since then. So it was a it was a pretty fascinating experience to sit down in Omaha with these people who had met him when he was a kid, starting out in investing, raising his first fund, and uh, you know, in their kitchens that you know these people who had to decide this kid looks pretty green, but he talks awful smart. Should we go in with him? And uh, yeah, it was a fun experience. That's great. So, Roger, tell you you've written. Uh, tell us you've written these books. You wrote for the Wall Street Journal. You you, you wrote the column. You wrote other articles, etc. You. you continue to do that. Tell us, can you capsulize what you have learned from the financial markets by writing these books and writing for all these years uh, in the Journal, now the Post, and elsewhere? Well, you know, John Kenneth Galbraith uh, said the the economic historian is. Uh, is the only historian of whom uh, uh, people go to and say, "What are you going to do to prevent, uh, you know, a, a recurrence?" You know, he said this after he wrote the Great Crash about um, uh, the 1929 uh, stock market crash. And of course, he he said that because people kept asking him, uh, uh, you know, how are we going to pre- prevent another crash? And I guess they asked him that because look how many crashes we have had since then. And but as you know, as as, as Galbraith said. Um, you know, they never go to General Patton and say, um, uh, you know, ne- next time we go through the Arden Forest, you know, what, how are we going to have fewer casualties or something? I mean, only the economic historian. And, and I think that's because um, uh, it is it is so uh, cyclical. Uh, and I don't mean to say I buy into these, you know, these uh, large wave theories that every, you know, 19 years uh, retail stocks are going to outperform tech or, you know, these bizarre uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, almost uh, astrological uh, theories. Right. But uh, human nature doesn't change, and therefore it, it remains uh, susceptible to uh, uh, high and low uh, emotions, what, what uh, you know, psychologists would call uh, you know, manic depressiveness or, you know, one, one or the other. I, th- I think there's one, uh, and so we tend to get these booms and, and busts. Um, I think there's one... Uh, lesson uh, in particular that that goes unlearned, and 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 that's the distinction. It was a distinction that made uh, that Ben Graham, uh, you know, the great uh, author of security analysis, and then the intelligent investor, and, and of course Warren Buffett's uh, professor at Columbia Business School, and professor of many others, but uh, tried to make this this distinction, which was the, the difference between investing and speculation. And, um, you know, you can talk to people about it uh, until you're blue in the face. Most people either get it immediately uh, or they'll never get it. And and, and most people will never get it. The difference is really, are you buying an asset uh, because you think uh, it's intrinsically worth, uh, assuming you're on the long side of it, uh, more than you're paying for it? In which case, you should be able to hold it uh, Indefinitely, even in, uh, more or less in perpetuity, unless you need the cash. Or, or are you buying it because you think that, quote, it's going to go up, i.e., uh, you know, uh, some other fool is going to pay you more for it? Uh, in which case, you're not really interested in what's uh, 
intrinsic to the asset. It's cash flow and so on, but you're interested in where the tax bill is going to go through, what the Federal Reserve is doing, uh, what the trend line says, uh, what the volume is, all the other ephemera uh, that has nothing to do with the intrinsic value uh, of the asset, but in fact is what most investors spend most of their time paying attention to. Well, we appreciate that. Uh, is there a particular surprise or aha moment that you had in uh, researching and doing these books that you said, you know, I didn't understand that before I, I got to this point, but now it really makes sense. Well, I hope I've had a bunch of aha moments and uh, I'm on my seventh book now, but I'll tell you one thing that is a real surprise. Um, I wrote, as you said in the uh, intro, uh, after Buffett, a book on the, the collapse of long-term capital management, a uh, you know a hedge fund up in Greenwich. It was a uh, for younger listeners a really celebrated uh, meltdown that uh, occasioned a larger meltdown among financial markets. Um, and um, then uh, some years after that, uh, I wrote uh, uh, another book on a crash. This was the the crash of the dot coms. There was something just spectacular about the dot com uh, bubble because um uh you know people were paying uh fantastic prices uh for companies with no earnings in some cases uh, no sales in some cases for companies of whom it was said that they would never need earnings uh, because they were uh, you know living in this sort of alternate universe of uh, the internet of the new internet then uh we had the, the spectacular uh, crash is slightly different in character, but uh, more or less simultaneous of corporate frauds, MCI, right, Enron. Right. You know, Enron was um, you know, truly a, a household name of uh, an institutional stock, uh, uh, you know, sort of a nifty 50, got to have it of its day, and it, of course, went to zero. A few years after that, uh, I wrote a book on... Um, the pension crisis in the United States, which is just um, this um, heaping on of benefits and refusal to, by mostly by state legislatures and, and local governments, to uh, tax or in any other way gather um, the revenue for them. And the, you know, the point of the book was, uh, you know, you can you can agree to low pensions, or you can agree to low taxes, but you can't do both. You got you, you know. So I was. I was very agnostic about what the proper level of pension is. That's that's a political decision. The sure. only thing I wasn't agnostic about is whatever pensions you, you decide for the future, you've got to allocate the, the resources for them. And um, you know that was in advance of of you know, Puerto Rico and all the cities in California and Illinois and and Detroit and so on. These these bankruptcies that have just um, hit one municipality and state uh, after another. So you asked me about a surprise. So the surprise was, after having written about long-term capital uh, and the dot-coms and Enron and pensions, I really thought I had uh, lived through and written about, you know, the great and the greatest um, financial disasters of my time. And, and, and then I'd never see one that, you know, that, 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 that uh, you know, matched that. And I started looking around for another book, and I just said, I'm, I'm done with writing about contemporary financial disasters because I've already lived through and written about the greatest ones of, you know, we'll see in my lifetime. And then about a year later, um, you know, the mortgage crisis hits. And yeah. Bigger than any of them, you know, far more enveloping than any of them. You've, you know, we've all gotten tired of reading. It was the greatest, you know, recession since the great depression, but it was, uh, and it, it extended to the entire credit system. Unlike, um, LTCM, which was basically a phenomenon of, Wall Street banks, this hit Wall Street, it hit Main Street, it hit mortgage lending, it hit securities lending, uh, it hit car lending, uh, it challenged um, every precept of the Federal Reserve and how to manage uh, the economy that it had you know, learned up to that practice in the recent past, up to that point. Uh, it seeped uh, you know, overseas and uh, with some help from injudicious lending overseas, became an international crisis. Uh, so I guess, you know, my surprise was, uh, you know, I thought I'd, I'd seen the big one, and that was all just, that was all just a run-up to the real show. <laughs>
Yeah, I, I can. I'll see never that. say never again. Yeah, uh, j- just briefly, uh, Roger. I'm not familiar with the book on pension. What What's the title of that? Uh, the, the title of that one is "While America Aged." While America, America Aged. Aged, and that was published in what year? That was published in 2006 or so. I think 2006 or seven. It actually, um, it's a. Um, it looks at three cases to, to make the point that there was a broader crisis. But the three cases were the New York City subway system, uh, which uh, you may remember there was a pension strike uh, that the subway shut down in um, uh, the early 2000s. And I trace uh, the subways back to the formation of a uh, avowedly communist union back in the 1920s and 30s that built in um, uh, these very generous um, uh, retirement benefits. Uh, meanwhile, the working, the you know, tenures of work and so on kept shrinking and shrinking uh, until, uh, you know, in New York City, generally, I made this point about the fire engines. Uh, for every fireman you saw on the engine, there was actually another one, but he was invisible because he was already retired, but you were paying for both uh, as, a, as a taxpayer. Uh, Another one was uh, the auto industry. That was the, the private sector example and how the uh, auto industry uh, had been uh, devastated by overly generous um, pensions and uh, uh, health care retirement uh, benefits. And the final I- example was sort of the nightmare scenario in the city of San Diego where there was actual corruption uh, with, with the city officials that uh, made deals to guarantee uh, you know, higher pensions in the future for unions that the city couldn't, uh, city unions, municipal unions that, that the city couldn't support. So these three examples became a sort of metaphor for what I thought we'd be facing uh, more broadly. So, Roger, let, let's focus uh, for a minute on um, your current, your most recent book, America's Bank. You, you discussed the origins of the Federal Reserve. Uh, but today, the, the, they are, uh, the, the, that's a real issue in question, not the origins, but the Federal Reserve itself. Uh, how would you rate the performance of the Federal Reserve since the credit crisis of 2008, given their original charter? Are their actions within the parameters of the original mandate, or are they somewhat rogue and out of line? Well, I, by the way, I would... Um say that the origins still are at issue just um, because I think the um, uh, if you look at the criticisms uh, particularly from the sort of Tea Party wing, the Republican Party, I think um, there's a fair segment of of the American body politic that doesn't uh, uh, consider the Fed to be legitimate or their functions to be legitimate and you know the uh, Rand Paul or something, but would rather go back to a simplified gold standard or uh, a Bitcoin standard or something. I'm not, I'm not in that wing at all. But um, I think um, the Fed is uh, the Fed's legitimacy is probably less accepted uh, today than it was uh, 20 years ago when you know virtually nobody uh, challenged that we ought to have a, a central bank. In terms of your question, I think. Uh, they basically, I, I'd rate the performance since the crisis. That's the way you pose the, the question. Since the outbreak of the crisis, right, I presume is right, what you mean. Right. That's very good. Um, the, look, you, you can't um, uh, ask you know, if, if the Wright brothers would be surprised to see supersonic jets. Uh, of course they would be surprised to see supersonic jets. You know, they invented a propeller airplane, and they couldn't have envisioned uh, supersonic jets, but um, you know they'd probably be pleased to see um, uh, a sophisticated, developed uh, uh, airline industry that is made uh, adapted to the current age by making uh, airplane travel affordable, uh, you know, basically to the average, you know, middle class uh, consumer. Uh, the, 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 the people who um, designed the Federal Reserve, and there were uh, Paul Warburg, a, a German immigrant who came to this country was shocked, banker, that we didn't have the central bank and we kept having these periodic crises because there was no lender of last resort. Carter Glass, a much more conservative uh, congressman from Virginia, later uh, uh, famous as the author of the Glass-Steagall Act. Woodrow Wilson, uh, had a president, had a great hand in it. 
Wilson was a uh, an historian before a politician. He was very much a scholar of Alexander Hamilton, knew about the early attempts at forming a central bank, and was a fan of Hamilton's. The, although the specific tools that the Fed used, you know, w- would have surprised the founders and perhaps in some cases been beyond their immediate comprehension. The idea that we would have a that that we would have a central bank that their creation would be a lender of last resort to create liquidity and stop a a panic from becoming a generalized panic was exactly what they had in mind. And you know, if you read the debates in 1913, uh, many of the debates were all about uh, what's going to qualify as money, meaning what sort of notes will this new Federal Reserve creating be able to. Uh, 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 to buy, because anything that the Fed buys, in effect, becomes money. Uh, farmers said that agricultural warehouse receipts uh, should qualify. They should be able to sell those. And they, farmers wanted the ability to monetize uh, their bills of trade. Uh, bankers in New York didn't like that idea. They said, no, let's, you know, let's be more um, conservative and only allow uh, uh, bank loans to be monetizable by the Fed. But they, they had this whole debate quite consciously about and, and, and in lay terms, what should count as money? And when the Fed then began to say, uh, we'll buy consumer loans, we'll buy mortgages, we'll buy not just uh, a short-term bills, the Fed always has, but we'll buy, uh, as in the QE1 and QE2, treasury bonds, they were expanding the, the immediate working definition of money to make it more liberal, to supply more liquidity. But that was exactly the type of action uh, that was envisioned or debated in those early debates. So, you know, would, would, would the exact actions have been forecast by the founders? No, but was that the basic idea? I think absolutely yes. Well, we appreciate that input. So, so tell us before we close here briefly. What are you doing today, Roger? I'm uh, working on a book about uh, Abraham Lincoln's um, economic agenda, both uh, before and uh, the Civil War, when of course he was uh, out of power, but a uh, a struggling legislator and briefly a Whig congressman trying to put Alexander, Alexander Hamilton's program basically to create opportunity for the working man in place and what he actually did in the Civil War to make that happen and how he really, uh, under the tremendous financial pressures of the war, uh, revolutionized uh, the government and the economy. Okay, great. Well, our, our best wishes that that will go well and you see it being published about when? Uh, you know, I never like to make that promise, particularly before I've turned in a manuscript, but a couple of years. A couple of years. Okay. Yeah. So uh, for anyone who would like to contact you, Roger, uh, do you have a website? What, what, what can they do here? Yes, I do. Uh, uh, RogerLowenstein.com. And, and, and there's a place there to send me a note or, you know, buy any of the books or, or uh, you know, share their thoughts or whatever they want to do. Okay. Appreciate that. So final words for our listeners here. Well, it's been a real pleasure to be on the show. I, 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 you have a great show, and, and I'm honored to be on it. Well, thank you, and, and we appreciate your willingness to do that. And we hope that uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, does not have too cold of a winter, <laughs> and that uh, or you're, too snowy, or too snowy, and that uh, you, you, you put some of those fo- folks back there at Harvard, etc. Put them in line, will you? And uh, <laughs> that's a tall order. <laughs> that is, that's a tall order. So, Roger. Again, thank you very much for joining us here today. My pleasure. Again, we've been talking with Roger Lowenstein, author and former journalist and columnist for The Wall Street Journal, most recent book being America's Bank, The Epic Struggle to Create the Federal Reserve. You've been listening to Strategic Investor Radio on OC Talk Radio. We'd love to hear from you. Contact us at info at strategicinvestorradio.com and go to our website to hear podcasts of all of our interviews and shows strategicinvestorradio.com. I'm Charlie Wright, wishing you an enjoyable week and productive investing. Strategic Investor Radio is a production of OC Talk Radio and is provided for educational purposes only. Content of this program and the views of the guests should not be considered as recommendations by OC Talk Radio or investment advice from the host, Charlie Wright, or any other entity attached to this production. Investors should always consult qualified financial, investment, tax, or legal professionals prior to investing.